Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with the Juicy Lucy. That's right, this provocatively named burger is one of those things that doesn't really make a lot of sense until you actually make and try one. I mean, why would we bother stuffing the inside of a burger with cheese when we could just melt a slice over the top? That's going to be the same thing, right? Wrong. See, that's what I thought. But it's actually a completely different experience and a wonderful one at that. And to get started, the first thing we're going to want to do is weigh out some ground beef. And since I want to do a six ounce burger, what I've done is weighed out two three ounce portions. And please note, I'm using some plastic wrap underneath, which is going to make the shaping and forming a lot easier. And then what we'll do once our beef is portioned is go ahead and press that out into two patties using some slightly dappened fingers. Okay, so if you're doing a bunch of these, just have a ramekin of cold water next to you, which you can keep dipping your fingers into. And that will help prevent the meat from sticking to your hands. And by the way, many Juicy Lucy recipes call for seasoning the beef before you form your patties, which is great for adding extra flavor. But I'm not a big fan of that technique because you can easily overmix the meat and get something very rubbery and tough. So what I'm going to do after these are pressed out to about a quarter inch thickness is season the meat, but just by applying it to the surface and not actually mashing it into the ground beef. And what I'm going to go with is a few drops of Worcestershire sauce that I'll just sort of drip on and spread around. And then after that, in order of application, we'll do some garlic powder, some freshly ground black pepper, some kosher salt, and a little pinch of cayenne. And that's it. By rubbing and sprinkling the seasonings over this way, we've hopefully avoided overworking that meat. Oh, and if you're wondering why I didn't just use some fresh crushed garlic, that is a really good question. But anyway, what we'll do once our patties have been properly pressed and seasoned is go ahead and add some cheese to the center. And I'm going to be using a slice of cheddar for this which we're going to have to break up or cut to make it fit. And I tried a few different methods, but by far the most successful was to cut out a round piece like this. And if you don't have a pastry cutter, just use a water glass. And I discovered one of the keys to this is a perfectly even layer of cheese. Or if you're kind of breaking it up and piecing it together, that might not be the case. Plus, if you cut it out like I did, you get to eat the trimmings. And then what we'll do once that's been lightly pressed in the center is go ahead and flip one patty over the other, and then carefully go around the edge pressing those two patties together. And not just pressing, we're also doing a little bit of mushing and smearing. Okay, we really do want that edge nicely sealed. So once going around sealing it like this, what we'll do is flip that over and actually seal it again from the other side, just so we're not taking any chances. Otherwise, that molten cheese is going to start running out while you're cooking this, and not when we bite into it, which is when we really want it to run out. All right, so take your time and be careful with this step. I mean, you are after all the Lucy Lou of what your Juicy Lucy's cheese will do. And like I said, if you don't seal it properly, it will run out. I mean, it may anyway, but at least we're giving ourselves a better chance. And that's it. Once we feel those patties have been sealed properly, we'll go ahead and season the outside surface with a little bit of salt. And that Juicy Lucy is ready to cook in a preheated pan, or at least that's the plan. Clearly, my cast iron skillet was not hot enough, since there was no initial sizzle. But anyway, I pressed on. And what we're going to want to do is cook this for about four minutes or so per side over medium-high heat, or until we see some of the cheese starting to leak out and we get scared and we pull it out of the pan. So I gave that first side four minutes and went ahead and flipped it over. And because my pan wasn't hot enough to start, the food gods punished me by causing a little bit of that crust to stick to the bottom. But it really wasn't too bad. So I was thankful for their benevolence. And I went ahead and gave that other side four minutes. And as you know, I hate to go by times for anything, but that's sort of what we have to do here because we can't really poke this with a thermometer Otherwise, we're going to have greasy cheese running all over the place. And because of the cheese in the center, it's also hard to tell by poking. So basically, you're going to have to experiment with times. And I'm actually going to show you two, since four minutes per side, which is what this one was done to, is going to give us something very close to medium rare. But regardless, once cooked, we'll go ahead and place that on our dressed bun, which I've spread with my famous secret sauce. And for this first one, I also went with a little bit of lettuce and tomato, or as it's referred to in Minneapolis, two portions of vegetables. And then let me go ahead and press this together and take a bite so you can see the magic that is the Juicy Lucy. And what makes this different than just melting a slice of cheese over the top is that by having it inside, it sort of insulates the middle of the burger. And as hopefully you can see here, it really keeps everything extremely, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, moist. And of course, juicy. Not to mention all that molten goodness you see flowing out is not just cheese. It's actually cheese mixed with our seasonings and fat from the burger. 
So believe it or not, it is quite a different experience than just your normal cheeseburger. But anyway, this was the medium rare version, which like I said, went for about four minutes per side. And it really was magnificent. But personally, I preferred the next version, which I did for about five minutes per side to get something a little closer to medium. And even though it wasn't maybe quite as juicy, I thought the overall experience was a little better. I think more of that burger fat sort of melded into the cheese. And also, by the way, I did not miss the tomato and lettuce. Oh, and for the record, even though I use cheddar, the correct official authentic cheese is American cheese, which unfortunately is illegal in San Francisco. But if you're keeping score at home, this medium sharp cheddar worked beautifully. But anyway, that's it. My take on the Juicy Lucy. My apologies to all the fine folks in Minneapolis for taking so long to figure out how great this was. And not just great to eat, but also extremely fun to say. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. The Great American Burger Dog. That's where I get ready to have your burger world turned upside down. Well, actually not really upside down, more like elongated. And if you saw the recent U.S. Open from the Olympic Club in San Francisco, you probably saw this cheeseburger. It's very famous. You can only get it there, which means nobody can get it. But I'm going to show you how to make your own. And this is way more than simply a different shaped hamburger. So here we go. So the first thing you're going to need is an extra long hot dog bun. Those regular little short ones are not going to do. I think this one's going about seven and a half, which is perfect. And I do want you to measure it because we're going to make our burgers like an inch larger because of shrinkage. And by the way, guys, please measure accurately. Do not embellish. So if this is seven and a half, we want our burger dog about eight, eight and a half inches long. Okay, next we're going to shape the burger dogs, which is easy because we're using plastic wrap. Just put some down. We're going to place eight ounces of burger meat down on that. I'm using a nice 80% grind, 80% meat, 20% fat, all right? We're gonna pat it down into a rectangular shape about a half inch thick by about, like I said, eight, eight and a half inches long. And let's just do a quick verification with the old rusty tape measure. Yep, looking good. All right, at that point, we're gonna season this. So I'm gonna hit that with some freshly ground black pepper and some kosher salt. And the reason we're seasoning that surface is because what we're gonna do is we're gonna fold this in half and we're gonna have that beef seasoned from the inside out. So we're gonna fold that over. I'm gonna use the plastic to shape this into basically a long rectangle, sort of mimicking the shape and size of the bun. And like I said, it's gonna start off a little longer than the bun, but once it cooks, it's gonna be perfect. All right, so you're gonna do most of the shaping and the smoothing right in the plastic, and then you can unwrap it, and you can do some final tuning with your fingertips. You really want the edges to be smooth so it doesn't break up on the grill. All right, and you can put that in the fridge just like that, ready to go. Or if you're ready to eat like me, you can season that and head out to the grill. All right, so I'm out back. I'm gonna place these on my grates. All right, I want you to put those down across the grates because when we go to turn these, we're gonna use a spatula and tongs and we're basically just gonna roll them over. So it's just easier that direction so the spatula doesn't catch on the grates. And of course, we've talked about cooking burgers before. I kind of like to go until it looks like they're cooked about halfway up. You're also going to get those dripping beef juice stalagmites. Or maybe those are stalactites. I always get them mixed up. But anyway, some kind of beef juice formation. And right there I decided to flip mine over. And I'm going to give you my theory on why this is so delicious when we put it on the bun. But one thing I love about this technique, in addition to the season from the inside out, is that because of the shape you really get an amazing crust. All right? Because of the geometry here, you get some really great grill marks that pretty much cover the whole surface. And you just don't do that as easily on a thin, round burger. All right? I'm going to go ahead and top mine with some Munster cheese. You should probably use cheddar. And I just cook mine to a beautiful medium, about 140 internal temperature. That's how I like my burger these days. I'm not a big rare, medium rare burger guy. So we're going to pull those off. We're going to let them rest three or four minutes while we set up our bun, which has just simply been spread with mayonnaise. If you have time, toast it first. We're going to place down the burger dog, and we're going to give it the only recommended additional condiment, ketchup. That's right. We're going to pop that top on, and that is so American I can barely stand it. A hot dog shaped hamburger. And if you're thinking big deal, you put a hamburger on a hot dog bun, so what? You haven't tasted this. It could be that perfect proportion between the meat, the cheese, the bun, the condiments, etc. Or is it because Americans love to eat things in one direction? That could be. So I really hope you give those a try. 
Head over to foodwishes.com. There's no ingredients. It's just a technique. But still, head over there anyway. And as always, enjoy. How I cook my perfectly pink hamburgers. Do not let the photo fool you. I don't think I had the best lighting and or photography skills. So some of you are going to look at it and say, oh my God, that's rare. How could you eat it like that? And some of you are going to look at it and say, what do you mean? That's medium well. But trust me, for temperature, for texture, it was a perfect, perfect medium. All right, so here's my method. And I'm going to use a standard 8 ounce, which is a nice big size hamburger. It's about 3 quarters of an inch thick, maybe close to an inch. I don't measure. I salt and pepper both sides generously. I grease a skillet of any sort. Here I'm using my nonstick. I also do this in cast iron usually. I preheat the pan on medium high, and when I think it's hot, and if you're not sure, you can just touch the burger to the pan and it will sizzle a little bit. Or if it doesn't sizzle, it's not hot. And then I turn it down and I cook the entire rest of the way on medium. What I'm looking for is the heat to come up the side. See, you can kind of see how it's cooking. And at first, not much is going to happen. Two or three minutes later, you're going to notice that heat sort of creeping up the side. That, that raw burger is going to start turning opaque and then white. And this is going to take about five to six minutes. So right there, it's about halfway up or so. I need it to go a little past halfway. So see that? That's just about perfect. That not raw looking burger is kind of creeping up just past halfway. Not quite two-thirds. I don't want to get too technical here anyway. It's not rocket surgery. And again, we're not going so much on time as look, okay? So at that point, I'm going to flip. Now, the second side, we can't quite do as long. So however many minutes it took you to cook the first side, I'm going to subtract about a minute or two for the second side. So my first side took about five minutes. This side's going to take about four. And you can feel that it's still raw. All right, see how when I push on it, it just kind of pushes down with very little resistance? It feels raw. Two minutes later, three minutes later, it was a little firmer to the touch. It basically sprung back, and liquid wanted to pop out of the top. That's another sign. By the way, you can do that test with tongs. You probably shouldn't use your finger because you'll burn yourself, and then you'll blame me, and it will only partially be my fault. And that's it. I'm going to take those out of the pan. I'm going to let them rest at least five minutes. You're crazy if you don't let your meat rest. Get your bun ready, however you're going to dress it, then dig in. So there's no exact methods, but this does get you close. All right, if you want it cooked all the way through, bless your heart. But for me, it's not the best way to eat a burger. Rare is not the best way either. I don't know why people eat rare burgers. You should just eat hamburger and save yourself the trouble. So I hope that helps. Check out foodwishes.com for more information. And as always, enjoy. Chicken satay burger. That's right, I love chicken satay. That spicy meat on a stick, marinated, grilled, and then usually served with some peanut sauce. I tried to reproduce that same effect with a chicken burger. So this is kind of an experiment. Not sure if it totally worked, but I wanted to show you anyway. So step one here, instead of a peanut sauce, I'm gonna do a peanut spread for my burger bun. So all I did was took some smooth, creamy style peanut butter. I added some Asian chili paste, sambal, and some fresh lime juice. So very simple here. And I gave that a stir and it kind of seized up a little bit. So I probably should have warmed the lime juice first. But anyway, didn't matter. Then I decided to top my burger. I would do a kind of a vegetable slaw. Again, borrowing from some of the garnishes you may see on a chicken satay platter. So I did some finely julienned carrots and some finely, very finely, as you can see, julienne cucumber. And then because it's Thai inspired, I decided we needed some kind of hot pepper. So I did a julienne of jalapeno. So that was the base of my slaw. And then to dress it up very simply, Asian fish sauce for some salt, for some savoriness, and some rice vinegar. So really, really basic here, really simple, like a quick pickled vegetable salad, basically. And at this point, you're gonna to have to use your imagination. I tossed this with a fork. I thought the camera was off, but it was on, and then I clicked it on, and then I actually turned it off. So you know that'll happen once in a while, but you know what it looks like to toss something with a fork, right? All right, so I tossed that, I set it aside, and then it was on to actually making the Thai satay chicken burgers. So I took some fresh garlic, some coconut milk, some cumin, 
some turmeric, some more chili paste, and I'm going to give that a stir. So basically I wanted to introduce a little more moisture into the chicken, some of those spices you may see in a satay, you know, marinade. And then just a little shot of breadcrumb here, plain breadcrumb, just like a tablespoon, and a little splash of soy for a little bit of saltiness, okay? I'm also going to add some chopped basil, a good amount, and then of course my just pure ground chicken meat, and I'm going to stir that up, okay? Now one thing I should have done that I didn't do, and let this be a lesson to you, I should have taken off after this was mixed a little piece, fried it, and tasted for salt. Because ultimately, after I made the first burger, I decided this needed a little more salt and a little more spice. So I actually added a little more soy and a little more hot pepper. Yes, cayenne. Back to the burger. Once it's mixed, you're going to have a very soft mixture. So you're not really going to be able to form patties. So all you need to do, though, is spoon it into your skillet, spread it out. When you turn it, you can flatten it with the spatula a little bit. Okay? So don't worry too much about getting perfect patties to begin with. You can spread it out on the pan as you saw me do. Now mine cooked about five minutes per side. Really this is going to be up to you and how thick your burgers are or how hot your pan is. You want to cook it all the way through, but you don't want to dry it out too much. Chicken meat, incredibly, incredibly lean. So if you cook it too much, it will be dry. So just cook it through and you'll be fine. All right, so when it came time to assemble my burger, I spread my lime peanut hot chili spread on the bread, and then my chicken burger, of course, and then I topped it with a very generous pile of my quick pickled Asian vegetables, then some fresh cilantro, and then it was time to eat my experiment. And how was it? Not bad. Like I said, it was a little bland because I didn't have enough salt. But the next batch I did, I added more soy, more hot pepper, and it was fantastic. So there you go, a chicken satay in burger form. So if you enjoy that particular appetizer as much as I do, maybe give this a try. All the ingredients are on foodwishes.com, of course. And as always, enjoy. Turkey Shishka Burgers. That's right, we're going to make the turkey burger slightly less horrible using some of the same techniques and seasonings as the shish kebab. And you know what? For something that was made with meat that's 95% fat free, this was pretty good. So with all these cookouts coming up, you're going to want to know how to do this. So check it out. All right, so we're going to start with ground turkey. What looks more appetizing than ground turkey? Of course, the answer is everything. So that's not attractive. That's why I'm starting with breadcrumbs to kind of cover it up. So to our ground turkey, we're going to add some plain breadcrumbs. And then a little bit of a surprise ingredient, ground almonds. Guess what those are left over from? All right, after that, we're going to add some kind of hot chilies. I'm using a sambal chili paste. You could definitely mince up some fresh hot chilies. That would be awesome. Or another hot substance of your choice. I'm going to put in some freshly crushed garlic, some freshly grated ginger. We're definitely going to need some salt. I'm going to spice it up a little bit with garam masala, an Indian spice blend. Some freshly squeezed lemon juice some plain yogurt, and some chopped cilantro. That would be coriander for my British friends. All right, and then we're gonna take a spatula and we're gonna mix that very well. Do not worry about over mixing this. Not gonna happen, okay? So just mix it up really well. If you're not operating a camera, you can use your hands, but the spatula works great. And once it's thoroughly, thoroughly mixed, I want you to pat it into some kind of uniform, smooth shape so we can divide it into four pieces. This recipe makes four burgers. So I'm gonna take my spatula, I'm gonna divide that meat in four, and we're gonna chill that for at least one hour. You can totally do this a few hours ahead. But I'm gonna ask that you do it one hour minimum on our system. So we're gonna refrigerate that for an hour. Hour later, I pulled it out, and we're gonna form our burgers. All right, wet your hands. You know the old saying, damp hands make nice burgers. For this, you may wanna take off your wedding ring. All right, if you're single, you're gonna to need to get married before you do this step. So we're going to form those. I'm going for about three quarters of an inch thick, which is basically going to make it the size of a standard hamburger bun. So you're going to shape those. You want a very smooth surface. That'll work out best for the grill. And once those are formed, I'm going to cover those and refrigerate until my grill's hot. All right, half hour later, my grill's ready. I'm going to place those down. Remember, this has very little fat, so you want to make sure your grill grates are cleaned and well-oiled. You may even want to put a little touch of oil on the burger. So I'm going to leave them on that side about four minutes. 
After two minutes, I'm going to give him the old half turn because I like to do those fancy grill marks. Why? Kind of a show off. And then we're going to start looking at the side of the burger. And when the side of that turkey burger looks like it's getting cooked about halfway up, that's your clue to turn it over. So we're going to flip that over. Look at those grill marks. Don't feel bad if you're envious. That's completely normal. And about four or five minutes later, these should be perfectly cooked. And here's how I tell because I hate to stick a thermometer in these. Every drop of juice is precious in a turkey burger. And if you stick a thermometer in, you get like a gusher of juice coming out. So what you're looking for is a very slight crack in the top. There'll be some kind of imperfection in the surface. And you're going to see a little bit of moisture welling up there. Just the tiniest hint. And what that juice represents is the burger telling you, dude, I'm about to start squeezing out all this moisture. Take me off the grill now, please. And of course, you always want to listen to your burger. So we're going to take it off the grill. On the blog post, I'll explain how to do it with a thermometer if you want to be super safe. We're going to let those rest for three or four minutes while we set up our bun. You're going to want a generous amount of mayonnaise. Again, turkey burgers, almost no fat. It's okay. I'm going to put on some red onions and some tomatoes. I toss in some lemon juice, a healthy dose of cilantro. And that was super delicious. A turkey shishka burger. Do not let that ridiculous name fool you. This is really, really good. In fact, the problem will be if you just make these for a couple people that don't eat red meat, when the people eating the regular burgers taste this, they're going to be thinking, darn, why didn't I tell them I didn't eat red meat? I could have had one of those next time. So let me bite into this and give you a full frontal. You definitely get that Indian spice, the cilantro, the ginger, the garlic. So there's enough going on flavor-wise, but not too much. So I really hope you give it a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always... Enjoy. The world's best veggie burger. It's basically a mushroom burger, and I got a few requests for delicious veggie burgers, which is really an oxymoron. But uh, anyway, this is as close as I've ever gotten to a really delicious non-meat burger. So check this out. I got a pound and a half of sliced mushrooms, and I always cut them myself, but they had a sale at the store... Buy one, get one free. So I got three packages, half pound packages of sliced white mushrooms. And I'm going to saute those in a couple tablespoons of olive oil with a half a diced onion and four crushed cloves of garlic. And I'm going to put a little pinch of salt in there. And as usual, when you saute mushrooms with a little bit of salt, all the water comes out, which is what you want. Because there's nothing worse than a wet veggie burger. So we're going to saute that until they dry up, but in the meantime, I'm going to add a pinch of oregano, and as I continue to saute them on medium heat, they'll eventually dry up and look like that. So as soon as all the liquid dries and they start to get a little bit of color on them, I'm going to chop them up. Now, I probably would have, if these were whole, would have chopped them and then sauteed them, but it really doesn't matter. As long as they're in chunks and they're cooked, you're good to go. Now, in a bowl, I'm going to add some oatmeal some breadcrumb, some more breadcrumb, all right, some salt, very important, some pepper. I know you want to know how much. Go to the site. All the ingredients are there. All right, and we're going to mix that up. So these starches, the bread and the oats, are going to give it its body. We're going to add some grated Parmesan cheese, very important. That's going to help glue it all together and give it a nice, beautiful crust. When do you see this sautéed? Well, I guess you already saw the first photo, but this sautés up so nicely. All right, I'm going to throw in a couple beaten eggs, and that basically is my mushroom veggie burger mix. So we're going to mix that up, and we're going to let it sit, because see, when you have dry crumbs and oats with a wet ingredient like mushroom, you need to give it a few minutes to kind of soak up the liquid before you form the patties. So just let it sit for about 15 minutes, and you'll find it much easier to shape. You can even refrigerate this and do it, you know, the next day. So what I'm going to do, this much is going to make about, I don't know, four to six burgers, depending on what size you make them. So I'm going to put a little oil on my hands or a little water, just so it doesn't stick, and I'm going to form some burgers. And then the rest is so easy. Look at that. I'm going to fry this in a little bit of olive oil. Let it go five or six minutes. You want a nice crust on there. And the mushrooms really give it a meaty flavor. I uh, serve this like I serve a burger on a nice uh, fresh hamburger roll with some uh, spicy mayonnaise, a little lettuce. That was unbelievable. And of course, I'll say the obligatory, serve it with your favorite hamburger condiments. I hope you give that a try. It is super delicious. It is a veggie burger that's not horrible. 
And uh, anyway, go to the site. All the ingredients are there. And as always, enjoy. Sweet potato, hamburger, and slider buns. That's right, I told you I'd show you how to make these during our recently posted teriyaki burger video. And besides being more delicious, nutritious, and beautiful than anything from a store, by making these yourself at home, you can ensure your bun will be the exact size of your burger. Although I guess we could just shape our burgers the same size as any bun. So you know what, forget that reason. Let's just go back to the original three reasons. More delicious, more nutritious, and way, way better looking. So let's go ahead and get started. And because these are sweet potato buns, we need some sweet potatoes. So what we'll do is we'll peel and cube some orange flesh sweet potatoes, often sold incorrectly as yams, and we'll add those to some cold water in a saucepan, along with a generous pinch of salt, and we'll bring that up to a boil, at which point we can lower it down to medium low, and we'll just simmer that until our potatoes are tender. And just not sorta of tender. We do want these nice and soft. So I'm gonna use a knife to test mine, and after checking a couple, it was clear these were ready. So what we'll do when those are tender is we'll drain them very, very well. And then we'll take a potato masher and mash these as fine as we can. And if you've been looking for a way to dirty your blender or food processor, feel free. But for me, this masher works just fine. and takes like five seconds to clean. And then once our sweet potatoes have been cooked and mashed, we will simply leave them to cool down to room temperature. They can be a little warm when we add them to the dough, but if it's too hot, it will kill the yeast. So we'll let that cool down and we'll move on to start the dough. So in a bowl, we'll add one package of dry active yeast, to which I'm going to add some all-purpose flour, as well as some warm water, and we'll take a whisk and we'll mix that up. And the reason we like to start a lot of these dough recipes out like this is basically to make sure that yeast is alive and growing, and if it is, give it a little head start. So once that's mixed, I like to cover it for about 15 or 20 minutes, and when we uncover it, if it's nice and bubbly like that, we know that everything's cool, and it's okay to proceed with the rest of the ingredients. So at this point, we can dump in our now cool down to just barely warm sweet potato, which in addition to the color is going to give this dough a beautiful sweetness, as is the next thing, which is going to be a little bit of honey. So in general, hamburger bun recipes do have a good amount of white sugar in them, but here we're going with a couple less refined alternatives. And then like almost everything, we're going to need a little bit of salt. We're also going to add one large egg and some melted butter. And please do not skip the egg and the butter. That's what help gives a real hamburger bun its soft, supple texture. And then last but not least, we will add the flour, but not all at once. Please, for this recipe and pretty much any bread recipe in general, start off with about 75 or 80% of your flour, give that an initial mix, and then evaluate. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm gonna throw on the dough hook. I added in almost, but not all of my flour. I let that knead for a couple minutes, at which point I stopped and scraped down that hook and while I did determine it was too sticky, and I did need to add more flour, it could have been perfect. And had we just added all the flour at once, it might have been too dry. So the point is, there's really no advantage to adding all the flour in at the beginning. But anyway, I checked mine out, it was too sticky. So we just went to add enough flour, basically so this dough kind of pulls away from the sides. And once we do have enough flour in there, which may or may not be the same amount written in the recipe, we'll simply knead it for a couple minutes, until we have a very soft, slightly sticky, and somewhat elastic dough. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and pull it out of the bowl so we can take a closer look. And as I just described, we do want something relatively soft with just a little bit of stickiness to it. And you will notice a little bit of elasticity. And at this point, we'll just shape that into some kind of smooth ball. And by the way, if any rogue pieces of sweet potato come to the surface, you can just feel free to pick those out and eat them. But anyway, we will shape that into a ball and put it back into our bowl, along with a little drizzle of oil, which we will rub over everything. And we do that theoretically so the dough doesn't dry out. And at this point, all we have to do is cover it and transfer that to some warm spot to rise. I like to use my oven, which is turned off, of course. And we'll let that rise about two hours or until doubled. And if everything's gone according to plan, it should look something like this. And at this point, we have to do what we do for all these yeast doughs. We have to deflate it, but not in the mixing bowl. What we want to do is transfer that to a lightly floured surface and use our hands to press it down, pressing out all the air, and as usual, we only want to dust down enough flour to keep things from sticking. And as you're pushing and pressing this down with your hands to deflate it, you also might as well press it into some kind of regular shape. That's going to make it a lot easier to cut up and divide into our individual portions. So as you can see, I went with a rectangle. And I went ahead and I grabbed my trusty old pizza wheel and decided to cut mine in half. And then into quarters. And then each quarter I cut into quarters. 
because my plan was to do about 16 of these buns, which by the way are the perfect size for a four ounce burger, as you may have seen in our last video. And sure, if I wanted, I could have cut these in half and done like 32 slider buns, but I wasn't into that. And then once our dough is portioned, what we'll want to do is take a piece and kind of wad it up like this, just kind of go around stretching the dough from the top down into the bottom. And once we get it into kind of a ball shape, we'll finish it on the table with a cupped palm. And basically the friction from the table and your hand will create what should be a fairly smooth surface. And once our perfect little dough ball has been formed, we'll just kind of press it down and that's ready for our pan. So let me do one more a little closer. So we'll take our dough, we'll kind of wad it up into a ball and we'll place it down on the work surface, which by the way, does not have a lot of flour on it. Okay, we want that little bit of tackiness on the surface of the dough to sort of adhere. So we're just placing our hand down like this and again, using that circular motion and the friction underneath from the table and on top from the palm of our hand combined to create a beautiful smooth surface. And then once that beautiful ball is formed, what you wanna do is press it down. Okay, very important you press these down before you transfer them onto our line baking sheet because if you don't press them down nice and flat, they're gonna rise up too high and be too round and not that classic shape we're going for. Okay, we're trying to do buns, not balls. Hashtag buns, not balls. And as you'll notice, you wanna leave about an inch in between each one because as these rise and bake, they're gonna kind of grow together. So try to space them evenly like you see here. And yes, I realized four times four is 16, but one of my dough quarters was a little bigger. So I ended up with 17 buns, but that's okay. An extra bun is not one of my 99 problems. And then what we need to do before we bake these is let them rise one more time to double, which is probably gonna take about 45 minutes. And I just used my not turned on oven again. So we'll let those rise about, like I said, 45 minutes, at which point they should look like this. Beautiful, and do I dare say buxom. And at this point, we can preheat our oven to 400 degrees while we give these things the final touch, which is gonna be a little bit of an egg wash, which as you know, is just an egg beaten with a little splash of water. And in addition to giving these an extra gorgeous color, that egg wash is gonna help the next ingredient stick on, the sesame seeds. So I'm gonna take my jar of sesame seeds and give it the old shake a shake over the top. I guess you could use poppy seeds if you're one of those people. But where I'm from, if it doesn't have sesame seeds, it's not a hamburger bun. And once our buns have been egg washed and seeded, they're ready to transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 15 minutes or until they look like this. Check it out. If those aren't the most beautiful hamburger buns you've ever seen, I would love to talk to you about some of the hamburger buns you've seen. And not only are they beautiful, they are so impossibly light that I really think you're gonna be surprised. And yes, unlike me, please let these cool down completely before you tear into them. But I had people to see, things to do, and burgers to eat. So I tore one open and forget their beauty and the fact that we used nominally more nutritious ingredients. The taste and texture on these things was incredible. So soft, so supple, just beautifully buttery with just the right amount of sweetness. I mean, in my opinion, just the absolute perfect combination of taste, texture, and appearance for a hamburger bun. I mean, one reason people love fast food so much, besides the copious amounts of MSG they add, are these sweet, soft, supple buns. True story, that's one of the things that keeps you coming back. But anyway, that's it. I really did love everything about these. Next week at work, after all the holiday cookouts, people won't be talking about how good the potato salad was, or that they used grass-fed beef for the sliders. Nope, no one's gonna remember any of that. The only thing that anyone's still gonna be talking about is the person that brought those homemade sweet potato buns. And you know what? That person could be you. So I really do hope you give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.